Hi there folks, it's Mike here, and welcome to another lesson on design patterns. In this lesson, I'm going to be continuing our discussion of the factory pattern. It's a very popular operational design pattern that helps us create objects. That is, we're able to avoid just using new. So let me go ahead and remind us a little bit about what this pattern's doing, and then introduce to you the extensible factory, which is another way that we can advance and improve on our factory pattern yet again. So here's the basic idea. We've been looking at factory as a way to create objects, that is to avoid just having to use new to directly instantiate our objects. Instead, we'll use some sort of method to create our objects. That's the goal or the name of the pattern, factory method or factory function. Previously, we've looked at some ways we can also add some power to them. So if you need to review, go ahead and look in the playlist so you can see the previous videos before continuing on here. But the basic idea is that we can have some sort of object here that serves as an interface. So I, uh, game object, is something that we've been using. And then we'll have a bunch of other classes that are derived from this, such as, say, planes or boats. And then the user can create appropriately planes or boats by asking for that particular object from their factory. So something like make game object. And then they'll send in some parameter here. Maybe it's a string, maybe it's an enum, maybe it's just something such that this parameter is a plane or a boat, and then it'll return some instance of an iGame object. So that's on my left side. And again, because a plane or a boat is a iGame object, we can make use of this. So that was the basic idea. But today what I want to introduce to you is the extensible factory. Extensible factory. And this tries to solve the problem that, well, what if your users also want to create other types? So we have boat here and we have plane, but what if our users through some plugin system have some other game object? And today I'm going to introduce the ant. That is, they have created using inheritance uh, or derived some new type from iGame object. How could we ensure that that object is also registered so that this factory will do the right thing and give us that object? Again, if you have a plugin system or perhaps are generating objects by loading configuration files, this makes sense as something that you want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and do a walkthrough of an implementation. If you want further notes on this, I take a look at the modern CPP design book by Andre Alexandrescu for more in-depth notes on this, or the API C++ design book by Martin Reddy, which is where I learned this pattern from. So without further ado, let's go ahead and look at a working example so you can get started here. All right, so switching over to our code here, what I want to review with you is, again, just this idea that we have this I game class here. Again, that's the base class from which we're going to derive all of our game objects for this particular factory. And then I have, uh, in a sense here, just derived some types here. So here's a plane, here's a boat, and they're both derived from game object. So that way it implements the interface with whatever the functions want to do. Now, what's going to be different about this pattern is that each of our different types here, plane and boat, we look at them, are going to have a create member function available. And the job of this create function, which you'll notice is static, is to return a new boat or a new plane. And you can call the appropriate constructor or have reasonable defaults. But what this allows us to do then is if a user creates their own type, is also to implement create member function. And we can use this as a callback function that allows us to know, well, how do we create one of these things rather than again just directly calling the constructor? Okay, so that's one of the key ideas with this pattern. So now again, if I create a new derived class here, so an ant or some other object, I implement create and then I return the new type. Make sense? Let me go ahead and move this window over and we'll take a look at the actual pattern here. So let me go ahead and open up uh, in a separate window here. Uh, the 
uh, actual uh, type actually that we want to create here. So again, let's say that me as a user, I want to create a new type here. So here it is, here's AMP. And again, I do all the things, I input my constructor, some of the member functions from our iGameObject interface, which I'll put at the top here. But I am sure to include one static member function or crate. Now I do have to remember to do this. You'll notice that it's not part of our interface here. So that is one of the things you're going to have to document somewhere or sort of follow the pattern if you have a extensive code base. So again, there's always some drawbacks with the factory and it is that we do have to pay attention to some of these details. But it's not a bad idea to do this in general. Okay, so now that I have this crate uh, function here and I've implemented it, let's take a look at how this is used in our factory. Okay, so I'll have my game object factory here. So let's take a look at what that looks like on the right side of the screen. So let me just go ahead and open this in BIM, our factory header file. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting for us here. So let's walk through this slowly so we understand it. And as always, the code will be available for you. I'll put a link in the repository uh, in the description so you can find it. But we have this my game uh, object factory. Again, I've taken the factory pattern and just moved everything into a class, uh, which is what's going to give this some additional power. So the first thing that I'm going to do is create a little type def. And the scope's just within this class, which is a nice idea. If you haven't seen this in C++, that means I just have this type definition uh, for a callback function that returns iGameObject pointers. Okay, that's the idea. I could use standard function or something else, but here you get to see it in the raw. Okay, now the key idea here, and I've made my window a little bit wider just so you can see here, is in this register object member function. So the idea is we're going to take in type name. This is how we're going to create the object. So is it a plane? Is it an ant? Is it a boat? Or whatever the user decides when they want to add this object to the factory, they can call register object. And that means that we're going to have a new type of object that our factory can create. And then we want to take the callback function, which is this here, this um, callback function here that returns a pointer to some iGame object as the second parameter in our map. Okay? And that is located here. So we're going to have this callback map. And I'm using the same trick again just to make it a little bit easier to type out. Uh, and this is what I read from some of the texts, which I, uh, or learned rather this trick from some of the texts that I mentioned before, where we have a map with our type name and then the callback function. So that's our callback map here. Okay. So again, why do I want to structure things uh, in this way? Well, maybe it's useful to draw this out a little bit. So basically, I'm going to have this map data structure, uh, and I'm just going to label it here uh, so we can sort of represent it in this way. Um, this is our call back map, and this is sort of the first parameter and second, and that's how we reference uh, items in C++. All right, so if I create a type here for plane, and it's a string, then I'll have the callback for creating a plane here in this map. And likewise, I'll have this for my boat, and I'll have that create member function, and then of course for my ant. And I'll also have that create member function here. Okay, so I think you get the idea. That's what's getting stored in our map. So this will call the exact function here that'll return a new plane for us. Because remember, we can have function pointers and well, what does our function pointer do? Well, it creates a new ant here as I'm highlighting. So that's the idea with register object. And likewise, I could remove something from my map by just passing in the key, which is the string here in our callback map. And that would no longer allow us to create something in our all right. And then finally, when we want to actually use our factory, and this is pretty similar to our previous implementation of factories, where we had the factory method, just a single method, we call this appropriate function, which will look in our map and then return the appropriate iGame object to us. Okay. So I hope that makes sense on the interface. Feel free to pause or again, 
view the code if you need help with that. So what I'm going to actually do here is I'll resize these windows here just really quick. And let's go ahead and look at the implementation of these functions on the right hand side. OK, so let's go ahead and open up our factory so you can see here. And I'll go ahead and uh, resize the window a little bit here for you. All right, so there we are, resized. And we'll see that I've declared my, or rather uh, instantiated my static member here for the objects that are in our factory. And now as far as the implementation goes, when we register an object, well, that's just adding something to our map here, which is the different objects that we can have in our factory. To pass in the string as the key and the value is going to be the callback function that creates this object. For unregistering object, we simply remove it. And then for creating one of our objects, we essentially just search through our map looking for our key to see if it's available. And then if it is available, then we call our callback function, which creates that object, which is what we're returning. So here we're doing the actual function call. Now, if we don't have the particular object, we might want to handle this in a variety of different ways. So for instance, in my implementation, I'm simply just returning a null pointer, which may or may not be the best thing to do here. We might actually want to throw an exception or maybe you know, log this to the user just so they know some types not being created. Because later on in the road, if they're just getting a bunch of null pointers, you might run into segmentation faults and have to track them. So there is more that could be done here on perhaps the error handling. But for now, we're either going to get a pointer uh, to our particular type because it's created here, or we'll get a null pointer. All right, so let's go ahead and see now how this is used in the actual uh, main of our code. So again, um, let me put this here and open up main. And we'll see that the user has you know, for whatever reason, this type didn't exist here, and they went and created their own type, and then they implemented a way for it to be created with our factory. And here is the actual registration of each of the objects with the appropriate callback. I'll focus on the uh, ant function here, since that's what the user has extended. Again, that's the idea of the extensible factory, that you can add or register more types to be created. And what I'm going to do just for this sample to show you something that's maybe a reasonable use case of this is, well, we register our three different types that can be created. And then let's say that we have a game or something and that there's some configuration file specifying the objects that should be created. Maybe a plane followed by another plane, a boat, a boat, and an ant, for instance. So we should have five objects thus in our factory. So what I'm gonna do is then read in from this file here, which is called level one. Assume this is what determines how our objects are created. And we'll read in each of these uh, files here, and we'll create a single object based off of the line read. Now note that these strings here, plane, plane, boat, and ant, and so on, are the keys of the actual uh, items in our factory that we're trying to create here, plane, boat, or ant, which match plane, boat, and ant from our configuration. And thus we can make our application a little bit data-driven in the sense that we're creating objects from our factory, or perhaps registering them and handling them some way if they don't exist uh, in our factory as well. Okay, so we'll add those objects to our game collection, and then when our game is running, we will just render them. All right, sounds pretty cool. So let's actually see this uh, in action here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, compile this with the following code here, so with our three uh, C++ files. And then let's actually run this. Now, this program is not going to really do anything interesting. It's just going to run an infinite loop. So I figured I should at least show you in GDB and step through the code. And maybe that'll help give you an understanding of just how things are working as well. So let's go ahead and do that with GDB, our program, and the text user interface so you can see what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and just put a, a breakpoint at line uh, 46 here, where I am creating the objects here. So let's go ahead and run our program. And at this point, if I print out what the object is at the bottom of my screen, I see that we have created some sort of object. And if I print out the line, so that was the thing that was read from our configuration file. And if we search through this a bit, we should be able to find that this is indeed 
I move out of the way a little bit, a plane. So that's what we're going to try to create here. So if I go ahead and, uh, and again, this is um, what I'm highlighting here. Go ahead and uh, just do this for you again. Uh, just where my mouse cursor is. So we're creating a plane here. So if I go ahead and print out, or if I ask what is uh, the object that we're creating, and I'm looking at uh, this um, in our window here, this object at line uh, 44, which I'm trying to figure out what the type is, because we read in, well, our configuration, the first thing is a plane that we're creating. Let's go ahead and look at the uh, V table to see if our object is in fact a plane. And it in fact is a plane here. We can see that it's going to call the appropriate functions that we have implemented uh, in our interface from our drive class here, the plane. Okay, so we can see now that our factory has read in from some configuration, looked in our map here to figure out what that object is, and then it's called the appropriate callback function to create a plane. Because now our object, which we've created as a um, I game object here, is in fact acting as a plane because that's what our factory are. So that's a little bit of a uh, mouthful here. And I'll go ahead and with this, and, uh, shrink this down. But again, just to uh, recap what we have learned here in this extensible uh, factory pattern is that um, we are able to create new types such as this ant class from some drive type, and then add them to our factory by registering them and storing the key as a string and then a callback function that will tell us how to actually create that object and make sure that we return the new type. So this is a bit of an advanced use of the factory pattern, but it's really great for us. Why do we like this? Well, design patterns, we often want them to be extensible. And this allows us to extend our data structure, as the name goes, extensible factory, and include new types during runtime while the program is actually running. So folks, that's it for this lesson. I hope this is really a nice use case for the design pattern and just showing how we can keep adding more and more patterns to, well, some of the patterns that you probably learned in the Gang of Four book. And just to know that there's many alterations with many different trade-offs and much more power that we can add to them as we know. If this was useful, go ahead and like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for your time.